So with us for this one, the Athletics, Stuart James and Jack Lang. Um, you've been to Benfica to spend time at their academy, uh, Stuart. Did it surprise you when you went? Yeah, it was a fascinating experience. Um, they were brilliant with me, Mark, I have to say. They, they literally did give me access to all areas. I could speak to anyone I wanted. Um, super impressed with... Everything they did, really. Um, I watched a lot of coaching from under 10s all the way through to uh, the B team um, and uh, spent a lot of time with players too. Um, I have to say, like, their manners were impeccable. Every player, every age would come up to me and shake my hand and, um, uh, you know, and say good day to me, which they're little things, but I think they're little things that matter. And I think they tell you a bit about the culture within Benfica. Um, that that really, really... Um, impressed me on in so many ways it was just a little thing one lunchtime where there was suddenly a huge cheer went through the whole building and um I was like what's going on there and this the under 23s were playing away from home but there were televisions around the campus and they just scored an equalizer in an under 23 game it wasn't an under 23 game that was going to win them the league <laughs> but that's just how connected everyone is there and you know they tell stories about the um the boys going to watch the girls team the men going to watch the women's team and all the age groups, really, there's this sort of desire to be in together. But at the same time, obviously, it's ultra competitive um, within that. You know, there's a small number of boys who are going to get the opportunity. And one thing that really did strike me was just the sheer number of boys that are there. There's more than 500 players in Benfica's academy system and as many as wow. 40 in an age group. So, you know, under 13s has 40 boys in it. And you're thinking... Crikey, I think the drive from the top, I think the the objective every season is to get two players from the academy um, into the first team. And, uh, you know, that's a tall order when you're talking how high the bar is set at Benfica. But you're also thinking that's 500 kids in that system. That's a, a lot who aren't going to make then it. But then is the other objective to turn out, whilst two may make it with Benfica, to turn out, say, another eight every year who at least go on to have decent careers absolutely that yeah and and one of the guys I spoke to actually did say to me that it's incredible he said you're whenever you're watching another first team game in Benfica uh sorry in Portugal there's nearly always a former Benfica youth player playing for one of the teams and obviously they do see that as a success as well rightly so and interestingly with the model they've got there where um uh, they have the B team uh, plays in the Portuguese second division. So a lot of the players are in the academy are playing professional football for Benfica, albeit not for the first team before they've left the club, if that makes sense. So mm. um, I think they've got some like 20, I think they said 27 academy players have played for Benfica's B team this season. So um, while only a very a small number are getting the first team opportunities, uh, naturally, Others are playing football, and you're right to say that is still a success, clearly. Uh, and I would imagine, we talk about the competition inside the academy, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, the academy football is competitive across Europe, but within within Portugal, Benfica are competing with the other two in the big three, are they, for kids? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's kind of an arms race. You. So I, I suppose I come at this from having spoken to a lot of academy coaches who, you know, I've done a lot of these profiles of Jean Felix, Bernardo Silva, Julian Diaz. So I've spoken to the coaches and it's quite rare to have an occasion when one of the boys hasn't just escaped the grasp of, uh, of one of the other big three. And I think actually just the structure of Portuguese football, um, you know, it plays into the hands of those big three. It's, I mean, it's, we're used to having a, a slightly changeable, group of of people who we consider title candidates but in portugal it's yeah it's really established only only two clubs have won the league outside of benfica uh, porto and sporting you know once a piece and so one was you know back in uh, the dawn of time essentially only only one in recent decades and that was 22 years ago now so by definition there is a kind of a, a gravitational pull towards these teams in stew's piece i you know it's one of the interesting things I thought was the fact that even Benfica, it's not a massive country, Portugal, but even they have these regional centres to kind of, I guess, be the, uh, you know, the the veins sucking the 
sucking is probably a, a bit of a cruel word, but bringing in like the lifeblood of the academy from all over Portugal. And Porto and Sporting are, are no different in that respect. So, yeah, it's it's no it's no real coincidence that you you will rarely find a Portuguese player like, oh my God, came through the system at Boa Vista. It's, it's generally one of these big three. Um. And and you will have you you will have uh, um, been spoken to Stuart in your time there about all these talent centres that are that are around the country that Jack describes as sucking all these players into them. Yeah, and they, they're seen as being hugely important to Benfica because of the um, opportunity opportunity it gives them to bring in players from all over the country. So someone like Antonio Silva, the nineteen year old centre back who's burst through this season and been excellent, um, he was uh, training at a talent centre in the north. And uh, Gonzalo Ramos was uh, training at one in Faro. Now, they, they are really important because, for example, from the age of uh, 12, under 13 level, they can come and be residents at the main Benfica Academy in, in Lisbon. But that's obviously a really big ask for a young child to leave home at that age mm. and throw everything in with football. So with Antonio Silva, he did that for a little period. And then he just couldn't settle. It wasn't an issue with the football, but he couldn't adapt to being away from home at such a young age. So he went back then to uh, his hometown and could carry on being uh, trained and coached there before coming back when he was a bit more mature. So I think those talent centres are seen as really, really important to Benfica. Um, it means that they're not restricted, obviously, to just having boys either from around Lisbon or um, staying uh, residentially at such a young age. What's the system for these for these kids, Stuart? I mean, you talk about the sheer numbers that they have. Mm. Do all teams play the same style, the same formation? Is that dictated to by whatever the first team does? Do they do, you know, the, the standard Ajax question? You know, do they rotate and one week play left back and then the next week play, you know, centre forward? Um, how how do they run? these teams at academy level yeah without um so they have a really clear what they call methodology and so from the in the younger age groups up to sort of under 12s they're doing a lot of 1v1 ball mastery they don't worry so much then about decision making and seeing other things on the pitch they want the boys to be really comfortable with the ball um, have that ability to take players on um, and then as they move a little bit older um, lots of the teams the basis will be playing 4-3-3 but they're not wedded to that and they'll have more what they call principles of play. So, for example, they're looking to build close connections all over the pitch. So they talk about moving up the pitch together. Um, it's very kind of, I have to say, Guardiola Man City-like. And, hey, probably no surprise, there's a symmetry with the you know the players who've gone from Benfica to Man City. So they are focusing on, um, yeah, building these close connections, passing the way up the pitch. Um, and then... Uh, in terms of the positions, it's quite interesting. They like boys to be able to play in at least three positions. So they would talk, for example, um, about the work they've done with Bernardo Silva around that. Cancelo, Ruben Diaz would have played as a number six. He would have played as a centre-back. He would have played as a right-back. And they think that is really conducive to, um, you know, the development of more rounded, more rounded footballers. So, yeah, they've got a, um, a very clear idea of how they want to do things. And I think also what helps with that, the feeling I got, Mark, was that not the feeling, but the reality, those coaches, a lot of them have been at Benfica for a long time. So, for example, the under-19s coach had been there 15 years and he started working with the under-12s. So, you know, you're you're having this real deep understanding of the way that Benfica operate as a football club and the way they want to create and produce players. Um, and, they, you know, they're totally on the same page with all of that. It's interesting because... You mentioned Ajax, Mark. Obviously, we think of Ajax and Barcelona as particularly clubs that have a kind of very defined philosophy of play. I like, I find that interesting in Stu's piece because Benfica at first team level, you haven't necessarily got a a strictly defined model. Um, so it's it's interesting that the the academy coaches do work to a certain um, structure. And and also just to go back to what Stu said about the kind of the early years being about kind of relationship with the ball. That's, you know, I don't think that's uncommon, but I think they really do place a lot of emphasis on it there. I did a piece during the pandemic on how Benfica were coping with, uh, you know, football having completely stopped and all the boys in the um, in the residential uh, part had to obviously go back to their hometowns. And I spoke to Rodrigo Magalhães, 
I think is the head of the academy, Stu, is that right? Yeah, he's te- yeah, technical coordinator, same technical thing. Technical coordinator, yeah. yeah. And I said, my question to him was, this must really be affecting the boys in the under-17s, under-18s, the guys who are on the brink of the first team. You know, they're, they're potentially losing nine months a year when they should be making that transition, be it to the B team or the edge of the first team. I said, that must be very difficult for them. And he said, actually, I'm more concerned about the 12-year-olds, the 13-year-olds, just in terms of how much they're touching the ball at that age, how much they're playing the the short passes. Um, He called it a golden phase. So I just thought that was interesting, you know, like, I suppose, even more emphasis being placed on those early years, just just the relationship with the ball before you even think about tactics or anything. Mm -hmm. And if we look at some of the players who have come through, I think about uh, Cancelo, Felix, uh, Bernardo Silva being really good examples. Just the level of sheer comfort and technical mastery on the ball. Um, I think you have to get that in there early because if not, it, it's hard to get it afterwards. There'll, there'll be fans, Stuart, I don't know, Arsenal fans or Manchester United fans listening to this or Chelsea fans and go, well, how much different is this really? To our own academy, we we will have support staff. We'll, we we you know look to bring players through to the first team. It's very it's very important. I mean, did you sense it was unique, or did you just sense it is one of the best in Europe, alongside maybe another four or five? I mean, Jack, Jack mentioned Barcelona, of course. Yeah, that's a good question because I think look, there's you, you talk about some of those other academies. I've seen what goes on at Cobham at Chelsea. I know there's really excellent academy um, work that's been going on there for years. I think the big thing you've got at Benfica probably, and Jack's obviously alluded to this, is is that there is a clear pathway. So you know they're not just developing, doing really good work in the academy and thinking, will these guys get a chance? They know they will if they're good enough. I mean, Antonio Silva, I say that's pretty unusual for, I don't know what you think, Jack, a 19-year-old centre-back to go and play first-team football at the highest level in the Champions League. If Chelsea had an exceptional 19-year-old centre-back, would he play? Well, no, it would be Mark Gurhey and he'd be going out on loan somewhere. Yeah, so, they tend to loan them to Brighton or Crystal Palace. Yeah, let, yeah, Colwell's a great example. Yeah. So, um that, that, that's the reality of the situation. That said, it was interesting. When I was talking to the under-19s coach, um, he did make the point. Um, he, he sort of said, it's not always like this, mine. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we don't always have a first-team manager who's totally connected with bringing players through. Um, and um, you'll know more about him than me, Jack, for sure. But they spoke so highly of Roger Schmidt, the current coach, they felt he'd really embraced the academy. So when pre-season came around, he took 14 academy boys with him. Eventually, that was sort of whittled down to nine, but it was still nine. Mm. And and they were looking at that. So A, they're doing really good work now. And B, they're thinking, and we've got a first-team coach who's going to give these kids an opportunity. Whereas sometimes, perhaps, they feel like at any club, the first-team manager is so focused on results and can't really think anything other than in the short term. So I did feel a real positive vibe in that sense there at the minute that the club feels very connected. 